over you, one toward another. Begin to release any hard feelings that you have toward anybody in life, whether you whether you're in contact with them right now or not. Just begin to release some things unto the Lord. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would cleanse me right now in your presence. Wash me by the washing of the word. God, cleanse my mind, my heart, my motives, Lord. Forgive me as I forgive others, God. Lord, if if there's anything in me that holds any type of grudge against somebody else, Lord, you've forgiven me. How can I hold back forgiveness to someone else? God, I thank you for the power of forgiveness and how powerful it is in the life of a believer. God, begin to release us, God. Begin to release us from everything that has come against us this week that we're trying to bind our minds, that we're trying to bring against us, railing accusation that would try to cause division in the body or discouragement to our faith in the name of Jesus we take authority over it we understand that your blood has cleansed us that we are washed and made clean by the blood of the lamb and we thank you for what you've done for us by your stripes we are healed and you have brought us into one body yes. and we thank you for that in the name of Jesus Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah, would you clap your hands and thank God for what he's done for you? Yes. Would you just begin to mix some words of affirmation to the lover of your soul and just let him know, Lord, I don't deserve it. God, I don't deserve your mercy, but you are. You are kind and your loving kindness and your mercy endureth forever. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. We serve a God of restoration. We serve a God of healing. And we serve a God who can not only deliver you in this life, but that has gone ahead of you to prepare a place for you. Yes. That where he is, we may be also. Amen. Amen. Would you open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? We're going to take our text for the purpose of understanding from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. And I'm going to go ahead and read through the rest of that chapter down to verse 34. It's not a long reading. But I believe we need to be a people of understanding. Yes. I believe we need to be a people that ask God for His wisdom. That's right. That study to show ourselves approved unto God. Yes. Workmen that He doth not be ashamed. That's right. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Beginning at verse 23, the word of the Lord says this. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it yes. in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
But when we are judged, we are chastened with the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he come not together into condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. I want to teach on this communion, remembering his body. Amen. Lord, I thank you, God, for this great sacred moment of remembering your body. I thank you for the works that you have done for us, Lord. Knowing that this salvation is by faith, it is not of works, at least any man should boast. God, but you have extended to us the right hand of fellowship. That you have brought us in one people, into one body, through one means of salvation. I pray that you would bring revelation into the sounds. Help us to see your body in a whole new light of revelation tonight. And help us to understand exactly what the blood of the Lamb of God did for each and every one of us. We thank you and we honor you. And we give you all glory in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands one more time under the Lord? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. In dealing with the manner of communion, I want to talk to you on the idea of covenant. See, God has always desired a real personal relationship with His people. He told His people, make me a tabernacle that I may dwell with you. That I might be your God and that you might be my people. In taking of the bread, the Jews at this time when Paul was teaching, they had a tradition that was passed down from Passover. The Passover feast was how God brought them out of Egypt and how God brought them out of slavery and how God took a people that the Bible says were the least of all people and he made them a chosen priesthood. He made them a royal people. He made them sons and daughters of the Most High God. See, when the Jews would celebrate this during this time that the Apostle Paul would be teaching, uh, there was what was called the matzah. And this was the unleavened bread. And the reason why it was unleavened bread is because leaven is ever continuing. It consistently grows. It never stops. And the leaven would represent sin. And sin, if you don't know by now, it will always take you farther than you were willing to go. It will always make you do more than you were willing to do. You'll say more than you wanted to say. And you'll end up more damaged than you would than you originally thought that anything could ever happen. It is, it is a constant growing. So he tells us a little leaven leavens the whole lump. See, sin is nothing to play around with. God dealt very harshly with sin. The reason why God deals harshly with sin is not because God does not want you to have fun. It is because God loves you and sin separates you and I from Him. And He loves you so much that He has to deal harshly with sin because He hates anything that would separate you from Him. Any parent could understand as we raise our children and things come into their minds and friends and, and peer pressure and influences come between us and our children. And all of a sudden they begin to look at their loving parents that want nothing but the best for them and their voice sounds different. It sounds judgmental. Mm -hmm. See, this is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden when sin came into the life of Adam. 
The loving voice of God that Adam longed to dwell with, to walk with, to fellowship with God. The voice of caring and joy and rejoicing. The only voice that he knew of love and compassion. And he said, when I heard your voice, I was afraid. Where did fear come from? Fear stepped onto the scene when sin came into the picture. Because sin brings fear with it and sin never comes alone. Sin comes with fear. Sin comes with torment. And sin yeah. ultimately comes with death. That's right. And the Lord did not come want on. anything to come between him and his beloved. Right. This is a relationship thing that yeah. we are talking about yeah. tonight. This yeah. is a covenant. Man, that's right. This was the Passover. This that's was good. this was the way that God would fellowship with His people in the Old Covenant Amen. or Old Testament. And in, in the giving of this Last Supper, Jesus would begin to bring revelation and He would say, this is the cup of my blood of the New Covenant. Amen. The New Testament. Amen. So He wanted to bring His apostles, his disciples. He wanted to bring those closest to him that would change the world into an understanding of exactly what the Passover represented that they really didn't understand. Mm -hmm. He wanted to bring them that understanding, illuminate what they had been doing ritualistically mm. and saying it's more than just a ritual. This is about relationship. And this is about covenant. And, and, and that bread that you used to take, that was my body. And, and, and the wine that you used to drink, that was my blood of the New Testament covenant. And he begins to give them this dynamic. That up until this time, this is the way the Jews would celebrate this. This pizza, piece of matzah or afikomen. If I'm saying that correctly. If you're Jewish and I'm not, please don't be offended. <laughs> this is the unleavened bread that is broken before the Passover meal. What they would do was they would take this piece of bread and they would break it into three pieces. And the middle piece, they would take and they would wrap it in linen. And they would hide the middle piece. And they would have the children go out and find the piece of bread that was wrapped in linen. And the child who found that middle piece of bread received a gift. See, at the end of each meal, that piece was brought back and it was distributed to the participants and eaten as the final morsel. In today's Jewish celebration, the second or the middle of the three pieces of unleavened bread is taken from a special bread called a matzah tosh. The bread is removed, it is broken, and the portion that is wrapped in the cloth becomes the afikomen, that is the that is hidden from view. After dinner, the tradition turns into this fun game for the children who then search, and they are rewarded with a gift when they find it. The bread is then broken and distributed among the participants. And they all eat this together. When Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples in the upper room, he broke the bread that we would know as the Afikonet. And he distributed it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We know that our Messiah's sinless body was broken in death, wrapped in a linen cloth, and hidden in burial, and then brought back, resurrected by the power of God. And when you find that risen Savior, God will give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. It, it was a type and shadow of the Lord saying, they that seek diligently for me, they shall find me. And when they find me, not only do I want to be with you, but I will be in you. I will send you a comforter. I will not leave you comfortless. But that comforter, I, that is the Holy Ghost. And I will come to you and I will be in you. He did not make a separation between himself 
and the Holy Ghost. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You found the risen Messiah. You found the one that got up Easter morning with all power and all authority. And he was saying, that was my body. Hallelujah. That's right. See, when you look at that pizza piece of I almost want to say pizza. <laughs> I did eat for a game. <laughs> that piece of matzah. When you look at that, at that, I googled an image of that. And the funny thing is, when they would, before they would cook it, they would pierce it. Mm. Wow. And when it would cook in the fire on the grill, it comes out with stripes from the burn marks of the grill. And the Lord was saying, that is my body. It will be pierced and it will be striped and it will be broken. And all of that is for you. I, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. Because this was part of a covenant relationship that God wants to have with each and every one of us. He said, this is how things work. Whenever a bridegroom wants a bride, he has to pay the dowry. And I'm paying the ultimate price for my bride. I'm laying down my life. You were bought and you were bought with a price. Yes, and the right. lover of your soul yes. said, they're worth more to me than anything that can come between us. So I will lay down my life. And I'll lay it down on Calvary. Hallelujah. See, part of this blood covenant that they would do in the Old Testament is they would they would slice their wrist and they would apply their blood onto a tree, both parties. Yeah. And they would say, as this tree grows, so doth our covenant grow. And Jesus said, all you got to do is partake and remember of me. And I'll pour all my blood out on that tree. And I'll take your place. And I'll be the sacrifice. And I'll make up the end of the covenant. And, and in doing so, as the cross grows in your life, and as you understand what the Lord did for you on Calvary, that relationship with Him grows ever more in your life. This is something where we have to remember what the Lord really did for us. The cross can't be something that we just throw to the side and it's just something that, that no Paul said I preach nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified why because the apostle Paul knew no one loves me like the Lord loves me with everything I've done wrong and all my faults and all my sins and even when I got it wrong the Lord stepped into my life and he said and I said who are you Jehovah and Jehovah spoke to me and he said I am Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. Yeah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad when, when the apostle asked the Lord Jehovah, Who art thou, Jehovah? That he didn't say, I am one of three. That he didn't say, I'm one of many. That he didn't say, I'm a way. He said, I am Jesus Christ. I am Jehovah, your salvation. I'm the one true and the living God. And there is none other like me. And I am the way, I am the truth, and I am your life. And I've come to give you life that you might have it and have it more abundantly. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So the Jews would take this. Not understanding what it even meant. In, in my research, the Jews thought it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when they were breaking it into three, three, three pieces. But actually, that middle piece represented the office of the Son. Mm. Not a separate person. You've got to understand that God operates in offices for the purpose of salvation. If we look throughout the scripture, he was the angel of the Lord. He was the branch. But yet he was the root. He was the lion. But yet he was the lamb. He was the high priest. But yet he was the sacrifice. These are not all gods. They're not separate persons. This is almighty God operating in different offices for the purpose of bringing his people back into relationship with him. Yes. The Jews never misunderstood this. They understood here, O Israel, the Lord our 
our God, the Lord is one. As they walked into their house, they took Deuteronomy 6.4 literally. He said, diligently teach this to your children. When you go into your house and when you come in, when you rise up, when you walk by the way, so the Jews literally, they will, they will, they, I have one at my house. They, they have this little thing that's got a scroll inside yes. with Deuteronomy 6.4. It's, it's angled just a little bit on their doorpost. Yes. And as they walk in, they will reach up and they will say, Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Because they want their children that are growing up to understand, hey, we don't serve the gods of this world. We don't serve the traditions of this world. We don't follow the ways of this world. Our God is one. He is separate. He separated us unto Himself. He's made us holy people. And Come we on. love Him. Amen. Because He first he loved, us. loved us. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. So Jesus would pick up this piece of unleavened bread. Because the unleavened, because the leaven would represent the sin. And he would take this piece of ma- piece of matzah, which was striped and which was pierced, and he would say, "This is my body. It has been striped and it has been broken for you." Mm-hmm. And the Jews would wrap that middle piece, the office of the sun. They would wrap it in linen. They would hide it like he was hidden away in a tomb. Then they would bring it back like he came back from the grave. And they would all fellowship together just like he brought us all into fellowship together. Whether you be Jew or Gentile, Greek or bond or free or male or female, there is no division in the body of Christ. So watch this. Psalm 105 and verse 37. I want you to get an understanding uh, of this Old Testament. Now in bringing them out of Egypt, the Lord says this. He brought them forth also, everybody say, with silver and with gold. gold. Part of the blessings that you can claim in being in the body of Christ is the blessing that was passed to Abraham that says, I will bless you. I will make you the head and not the tail. So tonight, I want you to claim a blessing and I want you to cast down the spirit of poverty in your life. Amen. Amen. I want you to bind that thing in Jesus' name and say, I am not going to live in poverty and be a child of God. My God, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My God is the one. He knows where all the gold is. It all belongs to Him. Matter of fact, the Bible says the earth is His and the fullness thereof. He, Some of us, He's just testing us and trying our faith. Right. True. Amen. Amen. Why do you think you tithe to the Lord? Yes, Lord. Amen. Why do you think the first 10% that you get goes back to the Lord? Mm-hmm. Because what you are telling Him is you are telling Him, God, you are first and these are the first fruits. Did you know He was the first fruit of the resurrection? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you imagine if He didn't give that first fruit? Mm. But yet it's so hard for us to give the first fruit of our income, which would not be ours had it not been for the Lord. So we brought them forth with silver and gold. And tonight in partaking of communion, I want you to claim, I want you to claim prosperity in the Lord. Yes. And not just not just monetary. Right. Monetary is a part of it. God wants you to be blessed. God, it is not God's desire to see His children struggle. Right. He wants you to be blessed. But I want you to claim all the blessings that come from being a child of the King. Amen. Watch this. And there was, not, everyone say, not one. Not, not one. one. Feeble person among their tribes. The second part of the body is for healing. Mm. So tonight, 
When we take communion, I want you to claim the healing in your body that you yes. need tonight. Yes. yes. Thank you, Jesus. I, I want you to, do, to claim that. L look back with me. Let me read this to you. He says, He says, He that eats, eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, for this cause, there are many weak and sickly among you, and many have gone to sleep. Why? Not discerning the Lord's body. What the body of Christ actually did for us. Now, now you've got to, you, you've got to, you've got to hear me. Two million plus people came out of Egypt. They weren't all 18. You had elders. You had children. You had, I mean, too many people. Just in our group right here, imagine us exiting Egypt. And two million people came out. And the Lord provided manna from heaven for them. Amen. And when they came out of Egypt, there was not one of them feeble or sick or weak. Right. You know what else happened? Their clothes grew with them and did not wear out. Their shoes, their Jordans grew with them. <laughs> you, you know how when you put on Nike Airs and that little air bubble pops and you squeak when you walk? <laughs> <laughs> you got the fake ones. <laughs> See, the real ones don't come with all the all, with, with all the problems. Mm. You know why some some Christians have all the problems? They might be fake ones. Mm. See, because when you really discern the body of Christ, when you really understand who He is, then you ain't got time for all the squeaky. Oh, I just can't take it today. The pressure's too much. You, you don't get all that squeakiness coming. Yeah, what you do is you understand the Lord's going to provide. My tires are going to last longer than they should. My transmission is going to go longer than it was manufacturedly made to go. My body is going to last more than it's supposed to. I can run up four hours of sleep when I should have got eight. God will make up the difference in your life if you'll just discern His body and you'll say, I know what the Lord did for me and I know there's no one that can do what the Lord can do in my life. He healed my body. He touched my mind. Matter of fact, He saved my life just in time. So pardon me if I'm going to praise His name. Pardon me if I showed up on a Wednesday night with a little bit of joy in my walk. Pardon me if I come. I, I came to teach, but I've got to praise Him for a moment. I've got to worship the God who brought me out, who gave me a better life, who gave me life more abundant. Do you know how blessed you are to be a child of the Most High? Glory to God. Powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you. See, the cross is where we as New Testament believers, we have to discern the body of Christ. What did the body of Christ do for us? Think about the bread when it was pierced. Jesus would take upon himself six piercings. The piercing of the crown. The two piercings in each of his hands. The two piercings in each of his feet. And the piercing from a soldier below that would go up through his side and into his heart. Mm. Causing the death of our Lord. Mm. would actually die in the broken heart. Mm. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 6. What did those piercings take care of? Proverbs chapter 6. 
16 through 19 tells us about the abominations unto the Lord. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Mm. Where does the proud look come from? It comes from the mind. Your brain is what does the scene. Mm -hmm. Because your eyes can be perfectly fine, but you can have a brain trauma and go completely blind mm -hmm. with perfectly good eyes. So the piercing of the crown will take care of that proud look. A lying tongue out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, we always go to the fruit. Jesus always takes it back to the root. He says it's not the tongue that's the problem. Because you let me clean out your heart. And you won't say those type of things anymore. You can't put enough soap in a three-year-old's mouth to get him to stop cussing. It's a hard issue. It, it's a hard issue. Someone's not loving that little kid like they should. Someone's not teaching that little kid like they should. So Jesus would take, the, the, the Bible says when they pierced him, blood and water flowed out. And that's when they knew he was dead. If you know anything about the heart, the heart has a water sack that is around it. And when they pierced him up through his side at the angle that the soldier would have been standing at, they would have went up through his side and into that sack around the heart and blood and water would have, fall, would have flowed out. That's how they knew the Savior was dead. And him taking that piercing of the heart would deal with every heart issue here. Out of the abundance of the heart oh that he speaks. Hands that shed innocent blood. Mm. He was pierced in his hands. He said, I'll take care of that too. Watch this. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. That piercing in his heart would take care of this one. And then, what about the piercing in his feet? Feet that be swift to run to mischief. Yeah. A false witness that speaketh lies. And watch this last one. And he that soweth discord among brethren. That word discord is a disunity. Right. It is a disjointing. It is a dismembering. How many hours did they hang on that cross? Six hours. When you hang on a cross for six hours, your body becomes unjointed, dismembered. Mm -hmm. You're completely out of joint. So why would the thief on the side of Jesus look at him and say, when you come into your kingdom, mm. remember me. He's saying, Lord, I, I'm, 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 I'm dismembered right now. I'm being crucified on a cross and my members are all out of joint. And Jesus said, this day will you be with me Hallelujah. in paradise. And when Jesus would break this bread and he would give it to his disciples, he would say, this do in remembrance of me. You know what communion does is it remembers the body of Christ. It brings us back into unity wherever there's disunity, wherever there's discord, wherever people are out of joint, wherever unity has been broken. This is the time where the body of Christ has to get this right. This is where you don't want to take of communion unworthily. But if you have aught against your brother, you make it right. You've got aught against your sister. You make it right. If if someone, I just don't like the way events go because they always do this and they always do that. Hey, this is the time where you get those things right. You get it out of your heart. That's why the Bible says that forgive me as I forgive others. Amen. See, it's contractual. The Lord cannot forgive you until you begin to forgive others. I know there's many versions that have taken that out of the scripture. Because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go with their doctrine of just believing you're saved. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you're saved forever. Once saved, always saved. I would really like for someone to give me a Bible study and show me where they find this stuff in the Bible. Amen. See, because if you're not right with your brother, the Bible says, if you come to bring a sacrifice to the Lord, and you have aught against your brother, mm. leave your gift here because it will not be accepted. Go make things right with your brother. Then come back and I'll accept your sacrifice. Right. What, what is he saying? He said, I cannot forgive you and accept this sacrifice until you forgive others. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when Jesus left, he made you and I the body of Christ. And the one thing the body of Christ was to do was to reconcile the world in him. In himself. So if we're bringing division in the body, he says, that is one thing I hate. He that soweth discord among the brethren. The Lord hates that. And when the Lord hates something, if you read through the book of Proverbs, when the Lord abhors something, you bring upon yourself temptation and trials and tons of stuff. So if you're going through some crazy things in your life, you need to check yourself through this Proverbs chapter 6 to say, am I doing something that the Lord hates? That's free. <laughs> the piercing of the crown of thorns. When we, when we look at the piercing of the crown of thorns, the curse that was given in the garden was, and man shall have to work the ground, and thorns and thistles will it produce. And that was the curse. The ground was cursed. And then he goes on to tell us a little bit more about that curse in the parable of the sower. He says, A sower sowed and some fell among thorny ground. You know what that thorny ground is? Study it. It's the cares of this world that choke the word of God. Mm -hmm. Some of us are so caught up in this world that we receive good word here on Wednesday and it's choked out by Thursday morning. Right. Yeah. And we keep wondering why. I'm part of that church. I go every Wednesday. How come I'm not bearing the fruit I'm supposed to bear? It's because everything that's been planted in you has been choked out. It's like the devil's got weed killer and he's just spraying it on everything you should be bringing forth. You know what his weed killer is? It's 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 the ways of the world. Come on. It's worries about career and yeah. finances and and peers and uh does is and, and here's the big one. Is that part of the Bible really for me? And do we really have to believe all of that? And I don't know. I feel saved even though I've never been baptized in Jesus' name. I feel saved. Right. Come on. I know the Bible tells me that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And I know the Apostle Paul found believers that were baptized another way and then commanded them to be re-baptized in Jesus' name. But it's been years since I've been baptized. And I really don't feel like I have to be baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, man. Well, that's kind of a care that chokes out the Word of God. Because if you truly read the Word of God, there's only one name to be saved in. There's only one name. So when I come across people, they say, oh, no, I've been baptized. How were you baptized? I don't know. I think in the title's Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But that's all Jesus, isn't it? 
well, there's no name there. You just try to write a title on a check and go cash it. Let me, let me write to the pastor and give you a check and see if you go to the bank and you can cash that. They're going to say to the pastor, who is the pastor? Well, that's me. What is your name, sir? Your name is what validates right. the reward. Right. That's good. It's true. If there is anyone in here that has never had a, a, a Bible study on baptism in Jesus' name, and why it is absolutely 100% necessary to become part of the kingdom of God and part of the body of Christ. Please see me. I would love to sit down with you and, and, and show you through the word of God that nobody in scripture was ever baptized any other way. Amen. Amen. So the piercing of the crown took care of all, all these things. See, we put too much on ourselves. We, we take all those things onto ourselves. We take the cares of this world and we wear it on our head. It pierces our minds. How many of us can't go through a day without, without things that prevent us from functioning properly? Because we're afraid. There's cares in this world. We're afraid of the doctor's report. We're afraid of what tomorrow holds. We're afraid of what other people will think. We're actually afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. But you know what cast that out? What Jesus did for you was perfect love. Amen. And when you understand how much he loves you, that perfect love steps in and it casts out all fear. Right. Amen. And then we have the blood. Mm -hmm. The forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 says, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you? Except you be fakes? Except you be reprobates? This is a time where we humble ourselves, where we come together to examine ourselves against the cross, not against one another. The Bible says don't compare yourself one to another. It is not wise. Amen. So, so it says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness. So if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, if you've been baptized any other way, you have, have, have to be rebaptized in Jesus' name. But if you have been baptized in Jesus' name, you do not have to be rebaptized. Let me tell you that. When you take communion, you are reapplying the blood to your life. See, when they would apply the blood to their doorposts, that was a representation of the blood, blood being applied to the entrance point of the home. And you and I, we have an entrance point. It's our heart. It's our spirit. It's our soul. Right. And we apply the blood once in baptism. Amen. Once. See, see, this is this is kind of showed to us in in um, when Moses smites the rock the first time. He smites the rock. And water comes from the rock. Mm -hmm. And then God tells him, Moses, go and speak to the rock. And he smites the rock again. And the Lord was wroth with him. You know why? Because that rock was Christ. He tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He only needed to be smitten once. After that, you just talk to him. Amen. So Christ did what he did for you once. He doesn't have to be crucified again. It isn't an over and over thing. You accept what he did for you. You obey the gospel. You repent of your sins and you die like he died. Not my will, Father, but thine be done. I don't want to die, but I know I have to die. That's our repentance. Not my will, but thine be done. My will will take me to hell. My will wants to party. My will wants to do all kinds of crazy, sinful things. 
So my will has to die. That's right. And then my will has to be buried. Right. And Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. Yes. You know why? Because he was only going to use it once. When we bury you in that baptistry, you're only borrowing it. It's a grave that each one of us borrow. That's good. You know why? Because we're only being buried once. That's right. And then we live with resurrection power. And the same God who raised up on Easter morning that we just celebrated, the Bible says he now lives in you. And if that same Holy Ghost that dwelled in Christ Jesus lives in you, it will quicken your mortal bodies and you will be able to resurrect. Not only from a dead life in this life, but when the Lord returns, they that are dead in Christ shall rise first. And then us which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Don't, do you understand that people without the Holy Ghost, God breathed it out. He gave the Holy Ghost and he's going to bring it back to himself. People without the Holy Ghost, when the Lord comes back, they are not going to make the rapture. The Lord says this very clearly. He says, if you have not the Spirit of God, you are none of His. It is the Spirit of adoption. You become a child of God by receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. The free gift. That's right. I don't understand people that reject the Holy Ghost. It is free for one, who doesn't want something free? <laughs> and then who doesn't want something free that gives you power? Right. Why do you think we got full grown men that get into this Marvel stuff? <laughs> you know why? Because they're supposed to have superpower. They thrive on that stuff because they're supposed to be living like a superhero. They're supposed to be casting out devils. And they're supposed to be walking and commanding supernatural things to take their place in the name of Jesus. They're supposed to be operating in spiritual dimensions. And when they don't have it, and they should, they begin to crave these type of things. I don't like Marvel movies. I'm sorry. I just don't. I can't stand stuff that's not real. That's why I love the Holy Ghost. Yes. Because when I got it, I knew I had it. And the devil said, you can't get it, but God gave it to me. And they gave it to me freely. And when I got it, I started to speak in a language that I never even learned. And, and all of a sudden I realized, my God, my, whatever that is, I, I can't stop it. It's welling up in me. It's like a river of living water that comes forth from me. And I can have it every day. And I can get it over and over again. And I can walk now as a son of God because I understand I've got the spirit of my Father living inside of me. And now I I can walk with dominion and power and authority and I don't got to be subject unto the devils that run this world. They are now subject unto the God that lives in me and works through me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You need the Holy Ghost. Watch this about the blood. Yes. Exodus 12 and 13. And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I shall see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Do you understand when God returns for that final battle to destroy the wicked? If you have been baptized in Jesus' name, you have applied the blood of the Lamb to your life. And when he sees that Blood. He will pass over you. Mm -hmm. 
It is, it is how we are saved. Watch Leviticus 17 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Sister yeah. Shane, could you come? The lamb, would, watch this. The lamb would then have to be inspected. And upon inspection, it would have to be declared over the lamb that there is no blemish in that lamb at all before being released to be sacrificed. Now watch this. They bring Jesus the Messiah to Pilate. And they say unto him, This man is guilty. This man has blemish. Pilate looks at Jesus. He begins to examine him. And he declares over him, I find no fault in this man at all. Qualifying him to then be the sacrifice. And so in the Old Testament, the priest would bring the lamb and at nine o'clock, the priest would lay that lamb and tie it to the altar. And then at three o'clock, the priest would sacrifice that lamb and would declare it is finished. And at three o'clock, they lifted our Lord. And they suspended him between heaven and earth. At nine o'clock, they lifted him up. And at three o'clock, he cried out, It is finished. He was both the lamb and he was the high priest. Mm -hmm. mm. He was both the father and he is the son. Yes, he is. He is. Mm. And we truly understand what the Lord did for us. You understand that God didn't send another. That he came made of a woman. He came made under the law. Hmm. And you understand what his body did for you. It was broken for mankind. He held six sunships. He hung there for six hours. And he did it on the sixth day. Six is the number of man. As he did this, he took care of six. Got victory over That's all right. Then he went to the grave and he took back the keys. And he said, You've had you've, you've had to bring to over my people long enough. The Bible said he preached to the spirits that were in captivity, the spirits that were in the grave. And he declared unto them the gospel. And those that believed that they resurrected and they walked around mm -hmm. came up from their tombs mm -hmm. Easter morning mm -hmm. went into Jerusalem and began to proclaim as a witness that the Lord had resurrected I believe that's a type of the two witnesses being dead three days and resurrecting and going out and telling the people Because he was the fulfillment of both witnesses. He was the Old Testament. He was the New Testament. He was the fulfillment Amen. of both. That's why Elijah and Moses met him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was everything and all of who God was in flesh for one purpose and one purpose alone. To redeem mankind back to himself. And he said, this I do. And there's only two, two, two things that you need to...
to remember that will sum up all of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament. And they are this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. In these two laws do all the law and prophets hang. And what he was showing us on Calvary was of God in flesh. And I've come to reconcile men unto myself that there be no more divisions among you Mm -hmm. to break down the middle wall of partition between the Jews and the Gentiles and make them both one people. There's not going to be two. Jesus ain't returning for two brides. Is returning for one bride. That's right. Amen. And it will be Jew and it will be Gentile. That's right. He's coming. He's coming back with a reward for each and every one of us. And as we partake tonight of this communion, this is a time for us to make sure we examine ourselves. Lord, am I right with others? Your commandments summed it up in two commandments. And I cannot love you and hate my brother. That's right. For if I do that, I call God a liar. Oh. Hmm. Church, do we love each other? Do we love this world with a godly love that says, My, my life I lay down for you? I live the life I live because I love others. If we can truly say that we can partake of this worthily, who should not partake in this communion tonight? Those who are not actively seeking to be more like the Lord and to have a relationship with the Lord. If you are not actively seeking revelation in the Word of God, and you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, and you don't think you need to, you should not partake. If you do not have the Holy Ghost and you do not feel it's necessary, you should not partake. But if you want all that God has for you, and you are willing to examine yourself right now and say, Lord, I want you more than I want anything else. And you are actively willing to have a Bible study. To be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, but you are actively seeking the Holy Ghost. And you desire for God to fill you with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. You should partake in this communion. I'm going to ask the ushers if they could make their way forward. As the ushers come forward and we're going to pray over this, if there's someone in this room that you have ought against, hard feelings, or if there's someone you know that has done you wrong, maybe you say, it's something so bad I could never forgive you. You don't know what they took from me. Well, then you don't know what Jesus did for you. Because the moment you release them, you release yourself. Amen. I want you to make up in your mind, if, if, if you can, and if you can get in touch with that person, make up in your mind that you will make it right. Whether they accept it or not, you will release them and tell them, I'm sorry, I forgive you, make things right with others. And it will be the most powerful release they've ever had in your life. give everybody a moment to take this time to repent in their sins.